This series that will be going on for the next four weeks is on the early history of the church. So in terms of... Hello? Good? So the figure, obviously, that we'll be studying in this series will be Jesus, but also especially the early apostles as well as the early popes. And I would say this. You can say this about Jesus. Jesus has been the single most influential person in human history. No one has affected human history the way that Christ did. And that's not just from a position of faith. I think that as from a scientific level and just using an empirical level of seeing cause and effect and how human beings have affected, really you can't say that anyone has affected human history the way that Christ has. He is the singular most influential person just in terms of looking at culture. My background actually, I did a lot of studies. My minor in undergrad was in anthropology and specifically in cultural anthropology. And so when you look at the development of culture, especially in Western civilization, how Western civilization has affected the entire world, the world economy, world politics, even things like such an Asian, things like this, really there's been no one who has affected the world as much as Christ has, and especially those early apostles. Really, because even if you were to compare him to the other world religion leaders, such as the Buddha, or of different figures from the Jewish thought, or from Islam, Muhammad, things like this, Still, no one has impacted the world on a society level, especially on the level of culture, as much as Christ has. Um, medieval Europe, also the influence that medieval Europe had on the rest of the world in terms of the New World, the Americas, as well as in Asia, Africa, even to this day. If you were to think about it, many people think about that, okay, most people in the world today, there's almost this false perception that most people are not believers in God. Anyone encountered that? So you actually, when you actually do the statistic studies on it, though, pretty much about 95% of the world's population today believes in a type of God. It just seems to be the, the most loud and obnoxious, that five to 2 to 5% of the population which does not, seems to make it seem like most people don't believe in God. But actually, 95% of the world's population believes in some type of God figure. Now, who God is is obviously going to vastly differ depending upon religious values as well as traditions. But really the idea of a god, now, because even you can make an argument that in Hinduism, as well, obviously in Hinduism, which has a multiplicity, a polytheistic understanding of the gods, even though in like Buddhism, when you look at Buddhism, you'll notice that Buddhism has this understanding of nirvana, where all things become universally one. The process by which you arrive at nirvana is by the annihilation of yourself. Sounds actually almost similar to Christianity, except for a few distinctive differences. But even in that, if you've ever seen like the Star Wars, the Force, this notion of eternity, every world religion has this notion of eternity. Obviously, within the polytheistic religions, you have this notion of how do you arrive at eternity, whether it be Mount Olympus, or whether it be the ancient Egyptians, or the Celts, or the Norse, Valhalla, and things like this. When you get to Christianity, though, which flows out of Judaism, and we're going to be talking a little bit about Judaism tonight, because in order to understand the early church, you have to understand the ancient Jewish world. Because I would say this, although many people today are talking about, okay, well, we all kind of just believe all the same things. That's not true. We don't believe the same things. Like, if you've ever seen some of those, now, I believe in peace and coexisting and things like that, but if you've ever seen, oftentimes, the ideology, where you talk with people of the ideology, we all believe the same thing. The Buddhists believe something very different than the Catholic or the Christian. Likewise, the Mohammedan, a person who follows Islam, believes their understanding of God. We do believe, like Muslims, in one God. But who we say God is, is vastly different. Because the Muslims will say that God is a God who is a property owner. It's what Islam means, submission. You are called to be a smith. The relationship between God and a Muslim is a relationship between Lord and property. That's why they actually s say that to call God your father is blasphemy. Okay? Now, for Jews and for Christians, we obviously will call God our father. And so that's a very different relationship. Now, I would make an argument that many of the Jews, will call God father, but the understanding of the Jewish understanding of fatherhood is going to be very different than the Christian understanding of fatherhood. The Jewish understanding of fatherhood is going to be much more of an authority authoritarian understanding of God, an authoritarian father. person who says it's this way, it's this way. He creates the law, you follow the law. He is a God of justice and order and mercy. At the end of the day, the relationship between the Jews 
The Jews are actually a are encouraged to ask questions and things like this, but still, at the end of the day, God is much more of an authoritarian father. What Jesus comes in the New Testament and reveals in the foundation of Christianity is that Jesus, that God, God the Father, and Jesus who is one with the Father, the Spirit being between them, that that relationship of God is more of an authoritative father, one who wants his children to live in order, who is the father, but will tell his children why. Jesus tells his disciples, I did not come to call you as slaves. I came to call you as friends. And because God's motivation for us following the law, following the new law, the law of love, is because God's heart wants us to live in love. And so Jesus is going to be very much connected, though, to his ancient Jewish roots. Jesus is a Jew. And he will create a religion of new Jews, which is the, what the early church is. It's the new Judaism. That's also why we, even to this day, as Catholics, we call ourselves Judeo-Christians. Because if you don't understand the Jewish roots, you will not understand the Catholic Church. Because we are very Jewish. Does this make sense? If you have any questions at all during, this, during our lectures, feel free to, I'll, I'll answer them. And I'll also take questions at the very end. Um, but especially if you need a clarifying question. So Jesus, let's start off with where he is. Obviously, most of you probably know that Jesus was from the Middle East, the most contested <laughs> as well as violent area of the world even to this day. And in the ancient times, it really was not that much different. But if you look at the location in the Middle East of where they fell, Israel fell, and I would say that God was very smart in why he chose Israel, because Israel is at the crossroads of the world, the crossroads of cultures. It's going to be the crossroads of Mesopotamia. In order to get into Africa at that time, because they don't have airplanes, and for thousands of years, obviously, there's not going to be the times of travel that we have right now. In order to, for the most part, to get into Africa, you had to go through Israel. In order to get into Europe from Africa, you had to go through Israel. In order to get into Asia, you had to, for the most part, go through Israel. It is at the crossroads of the world. It's also why there's constant fighting throughout its entire history. Because people, whoever controls that, controls oftentimes many of the trade routes. And if you look at history, history, and you'll find that as I talk, I'll be talking at times about money. Because if you really follow the money, you can follow and understand the history. The same thing is true even in the church. Sometimes if you want to understand the church, you have to understand the politics of the time. And so the politics in the ancient world, that this is a very contested area of land. It's also a very fertile area of land. It's a very nice area of land. Some of the parts are flat. The northern part is going to be flat. The southern part is going to be mountainous. This is going to be important because in the ancient Jewish faith, you have David who will rise as the first major king. Saul will come before him will be the first king of Israel, but David will be the first military king of Israel to unite the entirety of Israel together. Because prior to this, the 12 tribes which will invade under Joshua into the promised land, they will create a tribal system, but it won't be until the monarchs, Saul, will be the first monarch who's chosen. If you want to read about this, this is in the book of Samuel. Saul will be chosen, he'll create it, but it won't be until David, the successor of Saul, who will come about, who will really unite the two kingdoms together. He'll take all these warring tribes, which oftentimes don't get along. I'd say not too dissimilar from the early United States and the states. <laughs> okay, So he'll take all these warring tribes, he'll put them together. And for the, actually, for the most part, David, when he creates a kingdom, and I actually just came across this the other day, it's very interesting. David, when he creates a kingdom, he will have 12 leaders who will kind of be 12 administrators of his kingdom. And you know who the queen of Israel was under David? His mother. The queen was not his wife. The queen will be his mother. This is the foundation of the Davidic kingdom, how David will actually create his kingdom. Why do I make the point of this? Because it will be a very interesting when Jesus will create his new kingdom as the son of David on 12 leaders, 12 foundation stones, 12 pillars. And who will be the queen? Mary. And so that notion also, what, is the, what does a queen do? A queen intercedes on behalf, and that's what you'll see very clearly with the David, with the Bathsheba and Solomon story. Bathsheba will come to Solomon, the son of David, and will intercede on behalf at one time of his brother, right? Will actually not lead to a good consequence. But that was actually the role of the queen. The queen was not the wife, as we understand from medieval Europe. The queen was the queen mother. And she had a very in interesting role within that society. 
Without getting too much into that, though, you have to understand that David will, re- will unite kingdoms and will create a new capital. He will take Jerusalem, which is right there, kind of at the border between the traditional north and the traditional south. The south, which is very hilly, the north, which is more, for the most part, more flat. Why does this make a difference? Because later on, it will have a consequence in terms of the division of the kingdom. David will unite it actually together, and he'll actually be a unifying force because for the most part, he'll take the traditions from the north, and he'll take the traditions of the south, and he will try to create unity between them by creating kind of two different lines. He'll actually have two high priests. As opposed to just choosing one high priest, he'll take two. He'll like, okay, we'll take the one from the north, and we'll take the one from the south, and you both have to get along and work together. These two high priests, one's name will be Zadok. The other one's name is Abiathar, or Abiathar. You can read about this also in the book of Kings as well as in the book of Samuel. This will have huge effects later on. Okay? We'll also have two generals. David was kind of the master of having two people, both sides, being represented. Have two generals. The generals, oftentimes Joab will not get along with his other general. He'll kill the ge- other generals off. David will replace him with a new general. And things like this. He's, as David is trying to unite these kingdoms together, he'll have two priests, he'll have two generals, he'll have different things that he'll try to unite these two warring tribes together, especially the tribes in the north, which will follow and which will eventually be identified as their leading tribe will be Joseph, or what's called Ephraim. Ephraim is the son of Joseph. So the north will be identified with Joseph, the south will be Judah. Okay? Does this make sense? So during that, you'll find that David. The giant slayer who will kill Goliath. David's kingdom will be expanded by his son. And right here, this is David who expanded initially under Saul, will be the red. And then David will expand it up into where you'll find all the way up into Syria. Things like this is that David will expand his empire. Solomon will go even further. Solomon who will be considered the wisest man in the entirety of the world. And that at this time in history, which is about... Around the year approximately 1000 BC. David is usually put at about 1000 BC. David and Solomon will come after about, David will rule for about 40 years. Solomon will take over. Solomon will create all of the great structures of Jerusalem. And the biggest one that he'll create and the most magnificent and well renowned will be the Temple of Solomon, which David was not allowed to make a temple because of the bloodshed on his hand, as well as his many sins. Solomon will create one of the great wonders of the world who create the Temple of Solomon. His wisdom will be renowned. You'll have people all the way from Ethiopia, as well as the Queen of Sheba. You'll have people flocking. And at this point in history, this is considered the high point of the Jewish history, where the Jews, at this point in history, will become kind of the center of the Mesopotamian world. And this will be kind of their golden age, the age of David and Solomon, so a period of about 80 years. All right? Now, as we all know, Building things is expensive, right? As we all know from just our, our, our American economy. Building things is expensive. And then the question is, how are we going to pay for these things? So Solomon, as well as David under him, David will tax. Solomon will tax p- the people as well, as especially warring tribes. People who didn't want to go to war, they will have to send tribute to Solomon. Okay, and this was a very common practice in the world. If you don't want to get killed, send this tribute, and we'll leave you alone. Is, right? Solomon will do that. When Solomon dies, though, his son, who Scripture will call, and my favorite description in all of Scripture, calls that his son was an ass of a man. (laughs) So it's that ass of a man elsewhere in the Scriptures. His name is Rehoboam. Rehoboam, who wants to outdo his father in glory. Again, just think about it. Again, every son wants to outdo his father. How are you going to outdo Solomon? So the people come to Rehoboam, and they say, Rehoboam, We've been heavily taxed under your father. You have all these different things. We want a tax break. And Rehoboam will say, not only am I not going to give you a tax break, I'm going to increase your taxes, <laughs> which will lead to open warfare. Mm-hmm. You'll have a rebellion. Like I said, it goes back oftentimes, more often than not, to money and to resources. goes to an open rebellion, and those two competing tribes, or especially the two competing ones, Judah and Israel, will separate. The north will go with a man by the name of Jeroboam. The south will go and will stay loyal to Rehoboam. The sons of David, the north will stay with Jeroboam. And in the times of David especially, pretty much the entirety of the the kingdom worshipped God, the God who led them out of Israel. 
Well, there's a problem. During the reign of Solomon, Solomon will marry foreign women, something he's not supposed to do. Now, David had a lot of sins, but David never married, as far as we know, foreign women. Now, Solomon will marry foreign women, and Solomon will also allow them, as opposed to converting them to the Jewish faith, which is what he should have done by Jewish law, or not marry them, Solomon will, in a kind of politically correct way, he will allow them to worship their own gods. And this is not seen well by Jewish history. Because what will happen is that his, the foreign gods, those wives that he will marry, who will go up onto the mountaintops, because that's where you would oftentimes worship the pagan gods and things like this, they will go up and start building poles or the different altars. Now the problem with that is that the ancient Canaanite world, which especially up, up to the north, you'll have Phoenicia. Phoenicia, which is the, for the Phoenicians, the sea traders, it's where the color purple comes from, from the mollusks, which they came out, it's again a great source of wealth. That they worshipped the ancient Canaanite deities, which Joshua, when they first, the Israelites first go into the room, into the land, they had to banish out and get rid of everybody in the land who worshipped these foreign deities, these Canaanite deities, because there was problems. Because one of those deities was a deity by the name of Molech. Molech, who you sacrificed your firstborn to in fire, you take those ashes or you take them, put them into a pot, and you put them in your doorpost to bring you good luck. And, all right? That also in the establishment of cities, like when the walls of Jericho come down, like there have been a lot of studies done on the walls of Jericho and also the other Canaanite cities. And this was a common practice, not just in the Canaanite, but around the world. When you create a city walls, you would sacrifice children, the innocents, to strengthen the walls because this was pleasing to the gods. So when the walls of Jericho come down, this is more than just walls coming down. This is God declaring war upon a culture, not upon individuals in the culture, but upon a culture. Anyone who adhered to that culture was destroyed. Anyone who abandoned the culture was spared. That's what well, you can see from the prostitute Rahab in Jericho. She's spared. She abandoned. She goes with the Jews. You'll find that the Gibbonites come down. They trick Joshua into making an allegiance with them, but they're spared because they abandon those religions. But those religions, which more often than not entailed ritual orgies, which was one of the things for Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth was these poles that they used to have. Ashtaroth, they would have a ritual orgy, which if you think about it, you have an orgy, get pregnant, what do you do with the children? You sacrifice them. Does this make sense? Also, Ashtaroth was seen as the consort of Baal. So Baal and Ashtaroth were seen as consorts. And so this was the also within the worship is all these different practices. So it wasn't just like, like going in, like going to church, a different type of church or different Protestant branch or Catholic branch or Orthodox. It was very, very different. So when Solomon marries these foreign women, what he starts to allow for them is for them to worship their gods because he doesn't, what? He doesn't, he lets them worship it. He lets them build altars or poles up to those on the high places. That's why if you go into the Old Testament, it talks about the high places. The connotation of the high places is where these acts are going on. Not always the sacrifice of children, although later on at certain points in history, you will find actually the sacrifice. One of the kings of Israel later on will actually sacrifice one of his firstborn to Molech. Okay, so in this, you'll find a huge problem. In the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel will become polytheistic. They will worship Yahweh, but they will also worship these, all these different pantheons of gods, these pantheons of the Canaanite deities. For the most part, and that was the thing, because like, especially if you weren't well trained in your, in your faith or trained in the Jewish faith, it was just like, all right, well, I'm going to worship Baal, I'll worship Yahweh, I'll worship them, I'll make everyone happy, and they'll all leave me alone. Okay, that's what many people, that's to a certain part, sometimes what people do today. Okay, so they're not really that different from us. Okay, so in the northern kingdom, it's going to be very polytheistic, especially like during the time of Elijah, who will come about later on. Jeroboam will lead them into the worship of Yahweh, but the blending between the worship of Yahweh and Baal will become very blended after a period of time. And the reason for that is that what Baal means is husband. That's what the word Baal means. Baal means husband. Yahweh was also understood to be the husband of Israel. So it will lead to some blendings where people, especially who are not well educated, will not understand the difference. Of course, the definition of husband is very different. In the Baal religions, the definition of husband, if you've ever seen Star Wars, Jabba the Hutt. Remember Jabba the Hutt? He's sitting on this big throne. He has all these slave girls, slave wives chained to him. 
That's the Baal notion of husband. It's true. So that's where, like, that's where they draw, like, these things are not just, like, created out of people's imaginations. They draw them from cultures. They draw them from religions, things like that. That's where the Star Wars stuff is drawing it from. Conan the Barbarian, which takes place during the Canaanite, during the Canaanite times. It's the same thing. You'll find what, a guy on this big throne having, what, slave women, sex slaves underneath him. That's the Baal. That's what it means to be husband. It would be a very different definition of husband of who Yahweh is. You'll see this, like, in the book of Hosea. Hosea with Hosea and Gomer talks about what type of husband is God to the people of Israel. A very different definition. You'll also get problems because Molech, the name Molech means king. God was understood to be king. But then what is the definition of king? What does it mean to be king? But you can see why people, especially people who are uneducated, people who just going to ceremonies and things like this, don't understand what they're doing, why it can very get very confusing. Because in the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom will become, for the most part, very polytheistic. The southern kingdom will remain very conservative under Rehoboam and the sons of David and the grandsons and the descendants of David. It will remain the worship of God and God alone. Yahweh and Yahweh and Yahweh. They will worship God in Jerusalem. You will not have this rampant polytheism which goes about in the south. But you'll also find that in the south, the prophets of the south will start preaching about different things. If you read the prophets of the north, which is important if you're reading the Bible, when you're reading the Bible in the Old Testament and you're reading through the prophets, it's important to know what type of prophet you're dealing with. Because what are the prophets, what's God going to be speaking through the prophets in the north? Stop your sexual excess, stop your drunken orgies, stop all of these excesses, stop your worshiping of false gods and pagan idols, because that's what they're doing. Or are you going to hear the same? The prophets from the south are not going to be preaching the same message because the people in the south are not doing those things. What the prophets in the south will start, will talk about, especially people like Micah, was that what? Your sacrifices to God, if you come to the temple, they stink. Right? They actually get that God rejects them because you're sacrificing. You're doing all the right things, but your hearts are hearts of stone. Right? You don't take care of the widow. You don't take care of the orphan. On the surface level, you look all fine and dandy, but behind it all, you're a bunch of hypocrites. So actually, both of the prophets, if you were a prophet, you were not usually well-liked. But to understand that, you also have to understand these two kingdoms. Two kingdoms very different, very different, which will arise. They'll, they will be political allies for the most part. They will get along because they have to, because when they're fighting the Arabs, find Moabites, or they're fighting the Phoenicians and all these different things, you'll have a bunch of problems. But for the most part, it will be that during the kingdom of Assyria, when the Assyrians arise, the kingdom will be split to two, Israel, which capital will be Samaria, which is where you'll find the West Bank today. That's what most people don't realize. The West Bank is modern-day Samaria. So the Samaria will be the West Bank and will be the capital of Israel, the northern kingdom, the polytheistic, much more, you could say, uh, especially in terms of sexual morality, very, very promiscuous. The southern kingdom, very conservative, its capital will be Jerusalem. That's where you'll find Jerusalem will be the beginning of the hill country. If you look at the topography, you'll notice that the south is much more hilly. Why do I make that a point? Because eventually you'll find, as they're surrounded by all these different kingdoms, you'll find the beginning of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians will arise in about 650 B.C., and they will sweep through the country. And one of the things that the Assyrians had was that this was the beginning of horse archers the compound bow, and things like this. And they will use this to basically go across all the flatlands. It's, very eff it's in a very effective, if you look at tools and things like this, it's in a very effective tool, especially on flatlands. So actually the Assyrians will steamroll the north and will basically burn the north to the ground. And they'll take everyone's slaves in the north. The northern kingdom will fall to the Assyrians. But as soon as the Assyrians hit the hill country, the hill country around Jerusalem, they grind to a stop. They don't have as much success in the hilly country because they can't use their military might to the advantage that they can on the flatlands. Does this make sense? So in that sense, when you're dealing with the Assyrians, you'll find that the Assyrian Empire will destroy the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom will actually cease to exist. They will no longer exist. The Assyrians will come through, and they will pretty much butcher the entire. If the Assyrians actually, they would come in, they'd give you an opportunity to surrender, be made slaves. If you didn't surrender and be made a slave, they would come in, they would pillage, loot, and rape, and kill. Every male in the city would be, have their heads cut off. Every older person would be killed. They'd pile the heads up into big, huge mounds. 
young girls would be sold into harems, and pretty much the young boys would be made as farm workers and slaves. That's what the Assyrians did. This was, was the common practice among pretty much in the entire Mesopotamian world of what happened. So that's why ultimately when you get to like these talks, like especially like in Jerusalem, should we surrender or should we not? That's what like in the background of their mind is, like can we hold out? Because isn't it better to be a slave and alive than to be a free person and dead? Does this make sense? Also because they knew what was going to happen if they fell. So the Assyrians will go through. This also explains, hopefully, the prophet Jonah. Jonah, who's a northern prophet. Jonah, who's told to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. And he's told to preach repentance to them. And what Jonah doesn't want to go, because he wants all the Ninevites to burn in hell. <laughs> right? And that's literally what he does. He goes to the farthest ends of the world, because he doesn't want to go. Because the Assyrians didn't just come in and do this. They came in and pillaged, raped, and killed, murdered his entire country. The only people that the Assyrians left behind was the survivors, which was the abject and poor. And so these poor people, these very, very poor people who have nothing left, their countryside is burned, everything that they have of a value, all food is taken away. The only people who survive basically end up living in animalistic existence, again, of survivors and things like this. And so they will intermarry with the people around them. Okay? So you'll have this half-blooded Jew, these half-blooded Hebrews, in the northern kingdom, who will become known eventually as the Samaritans. Does that make sense? The survivors, the survivors who intermarry, and that was the thing for the Hebrews, if you intermarried with other women, if you intermarried with other nations, it also meant that you also married their gods. Right? Because especially that we saw that under Solomon. Solomon did that, and likewise, the gods of these foreign women were brought into and likewise polluted the land. And so because they do this, they will lose their Jewish identity. Well, actually, they weren't called Jews. They were just called Hebrews at that time. They will lose their Hebrew identity. They're no longer even recognized by the people of the South as being authentic Hebrews because they no longer have kept themselves as a people set apart. All Jews, all Hebrews are a people set apart. When they no longer set themselves apart from the other nations, they will no longer be considered to be Hebrews. So even the survivors will become end up being the outcasts. So you'll find that the Assyrians will be replaced by the Babylonians, which in terms of culture, the Babylonians will be a little bit more cultured, but in terms of brutality, they're going to be just as brutal as the Assyrians, and the same principles are going to take effect. The Babylonians will also, Nebuchadnezzar being the main and the most famous, Nebuchadnezzar will go in, and Nebuchadnezzar will take down the southern kingdom. And for the most part, the reason why is that the Assyrian, the um, Babylonians will be some of the first persons to use war engines. That's why they're able to take down the walls of Jerusalem. They're the first persons to be able to use like siege towers and things like this. So they're able to take down the fortifications of Jerusalem. That's where you'll have the hanging gardens of Babylon. And the Babylonian Empire will stretch even further across Mesopotamia, again, taking over most of the known world. And it's during this, king, during this time that you'll have the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah will be the predominant prophet in the kingdom of the south, in Jerusalem. And Jeremiah is actually telling the people, capitulate. <laughs> capitulate to Nebuchadnezzar. Capitulate. God is telling you that you have to capitulate right now. And the pride of the southern kingdom, which is very conservative, which is, again, has a long history, again, which is also, for the most part, moral, <laughs> like, especially in terms of like sexual morality, in terms of worshiping God and God alone, but at the end of the day, Jeremiah and all the prophets of the south will condemn the southern kingdom for their hardness of heart and for not taking care of the widow, the poor, and the orphan. Right? So the land of the north, the reason why the explanation for why the northern kingdom is destroyed is because they polluted the land with blood. The blood of the innocents. Right? The blood of the innocents. And actually, in the northern kingdom, the re rationale for why they lost the northern kingdom is that the land itself cried out to God. The land is a living entity, as a singular living, non-thinking, but still a living entity, cries out to God for justice, for the blood of all these innocents that have been seeping into the land, the pollution of the land. The land, and the land will cry out to God, and God will free them by sending the Assyrians, because God will always hear the cries of the poor. Does this make sense? And so the land, this is also the same thing that you'll find in like the story of Cain and Abel. It won't be so much Abel's blood, it'll be the land that cries out to God for justice. 
and God will have to give justice because God is a God of justice. He always hears the cries of the poor. The land will do it, and so the land will vomit the people out of its mouth. That's actually the scriptural. I'm, I'm not just trying to make, that's the, what the, land, the actual scripture says. The land vomited them out of their mouth. The northern kingdom, it will be because of their lack of social justice, because of their lack of what taking care of widows and orphans because of the hardness of their heart. They're slaughtering thousands of cows and thousands of sheep and things like this, but it means nothing to God because their interior hearts are not changed by these sacrifices. They don't understand what they're doing. They're not allowing the sacrifice to change their hearts. They're just going through the motions. And because of the hardness of their hearts, being also very prideful and very stubborn, the people of the south will resist Jeremiah. Jeremiah will preach to them. They'll throw Jeremiah into a well. And eventually, Nebuchadnezzar will come into the city and will do the exact same thing that the Assyrians did. Nebuchadnezzar will go through the city. They'll pillage. They'll rape. They'll kill. They'll kill most. Anyone who's a skilled worker, they will enslave and bring back to Babylon as a slave. Anyone who, again, the young women would have been sold into harems. Everyone else who was not considered to have any value or to be, again, a burden, old people, would be killed. You'll also find that all the children, all the babies, will be thrown over the walls of Jerusalem. Right? That's what actually they did. They took the babies and they would just throw them right over the walls of Jerusalem, which leads you to Psalm 139. If you've ever read Psalm 139, which is a very disturbing psalm, which talks about, by the rivers of Babylon there we sat and wept. You can read through that psalm, and at the very end of it, you'll find this notion of the severe anger against the Babylonians, which says, we hope that their babies' heads are crushed the way that they crushed our children's heads. Right? That's what the psalm says. Because it's going into, and it's written directly after the Babylonians had come in and destroyed the city, enslaved everyone, and so they're brought into exile. And one of the reasons for the exile, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, one of the reasons for the exile is that will be explained later on by the prophet Isaiah, as well as other prophets, the reason for why the exile occurred was because of the lack of justice, and especially because of the lack of the jubilees. Like every seven years, I don't know if you remember a couple of days ago in the readings, we had this like, of the, the jubilees, like all these jubilees which were mandated that you had to give the land rest every seven years. You had to release captives every seven years. You had to, what, give people if they were indebted to you or enslaved to you or that things like this, that you had heavy debts and usury and things like this. You had to forgive them their debts every seven years to give them a new and fresh start. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. They refused to do it. They were commanded by God, but they didn't do it. And so as a consequence of this lack and this hardness of heart, motivated by financial greed, they will be in exile for the number of jubilees that they lost, that they didn't follow. Does this make sense? So that notion of that you don't follow the law, you end up in exile. And it will be during exile that they will first be called Jews, during the Babylonian exile. That those persons, because many of the persons brought into slavery will lose their identity. They'll marry, intermarry with the culture, they'll just become Babylonians and things like this. But those persons who maintain their maintain their uh, authentic Hebrew heritage, the people who still worship Yahweh, it'll be the first time that those persons in Babylon will be called Jews. That will be how they'll be identified as, as Jews. And there they will, eventually the Babylon will fall to the Persians. The Persians will come in. And you could say that actually there's some, ev there's some people who speculate that the Jews were actually helping the Persians to overthrow the Babylonians or things like that, which is also why the Persians will be very favorable. The Persian emperors will be very favorable towards the Jews. You'll have Cyrus and Darius, if you've seen 300. This goes to the same time period, like in the Persian Empire. It's also during this time that you'll find the story of Esther, which is oftentimes attributed that Esther was either possibly in the harem of maybe Darius, or at least that's where the stories come from, of this girl who stands up to the king and stands up asking that her people not be killed after Haman tries to, again, kill them because he's not offered, because Mordecai won't bow down before him. You go through the story of Esther. So during this time, eventually Nehemiah, who will be the cupbearer, again, one of the most trusted persons in the kingdom, will eventually, after many years of service, will petition and ask, can I please bring home the remnants? And that's what the word um, is, is remnant. And we come across this word in Scripture, the remnant, the faithful remnant. In Hebrew, it's the, the Anawim. Can I bring back the faithful remnant of Israel back to Jerusalem? 
Nehemiah will be allowed to take back those persons who have maintained their Jewish identity, and they will go back to Jerusalem, and that's where they will find Jerusalem burned to the ground, and they will start to rebuild after about 80 years. Does this make sense? During that time, you'll have, again, it takes a long time, they will cry as they're rebuilding, and as they, again, it talks about in Ezra and Nehemiah, the crying as they see that Solomon's temple, which is now a heap of ruins, that they no longer have their identity, and slowly over time, they'll build up actually kind of a kind of a really crappy temple. <laughs> and, I mean, that's what they kind of call it. They talk about how horrible this new temple is because <laughs> it has nothing on the oldest people can remember the glory of the old one. And so they'll build up this initial one. And then for a period of time, the, actually with the Persians, things will be good until the Greeks come in. And Alexander the Great was no friend to culture. Alexander the Great, if you remember the process in Greek history, Greeks had a, pro had a uh, policy of what's called Hellenization, which means that he would take your culture, strip your culture of all of its cultural elements, and replace it with a Greek culture, because he considered the Greek culture to be superior. And to a certain degree, it was. Had more philosophy, had mathematics, had all the different Greek things, had the gymnasiums, things of this nature. He also had to worship the Greek gods. Because what Alexander, being a student of Aristotle, recognized is that one of the main sources of divisions in the world causes for fighting, causes for war, was religion and cultural differences. If you could get rid of religion and cultural differences and make everyone one, then everything would work. So, I mean, it's a great idea, <laughs> right, until you meet another culture, a culture which actually loves their culture. And there's actually no culture that loved their culture more in the ancient world was than the Israelites, the Jews. Go through, he'll take over, he'll get all the way to India, Obviously, and this is, again, the time of the Spartans, Alexander the Great will go Hellenization, which is where you'll find the book of Maccabees. You go into the Catholic Bible, into the Apocrypha literature, or the Deuterocanonicals, you'll find the books of Maccabees, which talk about after Alexander died, his kingdom is divvied up by his lieutenants, and that you'll find that the process of Hellenization will continue during this time. And in that, you'll find in the book of Maccabees that the Jews will fight tooth and nail to keep hold of their Jewish identity because they've been under attack for hundreds of years, and that they are survivors. Actually, to a certain extent, you can say that the Jews are the ultimate survivors. They had survived one attack after another attack, one exile after another exile, and that they will fight tooth and nail, and this will be the Maccabean Revolt. During the Maccabean Revolt, it will be interesting that you'll find that Judas Maccabees will actually, at times, do forced conversions. So he'll go into towns, he'll say, if you don't convert, you die. Well, most men who don't really care would say, okay, I'll convert, <laughs> right? He'll also do forced circumcisions of boys, right? Young boys will be made Jews because they were traditionally Jews. They had lost their faith and things like this. So especially in parts of Moab and things like this, you'll find what will be rise of what's called the Nabataeans, this ru these uh, tribals, who these kind of these half, these people who are, will be later considered to be kind of half Jews. Are they really Jews or are they not? They were kind of forced to convert. They're not really full Jews. They are Jews by things like this. This is what actually the, Her the family of King Herod will rise out of. Of these people, this, this, these persons um, out in the desert areas like this who will be forced into forced conversions. All right. It's also why Herod will be such a controversial figure. His father is a man by the name of Antiper. Antiper will be the one who will go to the Romans and will be one of the first persons to go to the Romans and try to bring the Romans back to help the Jews get rid of the Greeks. Okay? Herod will ally himself as the son of Antipor. He will ally himself with the Romans, and the Romans, as we know, will eventually take over the Greek Empire, and the Romans will recognize the errors of the Greeks, and they'll recognize that the Hellenization process does not really work. It only causes more problems. So from the Roman perspective, all that the Romans cared about, for the most part, is that you can keep your culture, you can actually rule yourselves, pay your taxes. Right? Now the Romans will not allow for new religions to come about. The Romans have no love of any new religions, because like the Greeks, they recognize that new religions are very dangerous. They're dangerous because they threaten to destabilize a region. It has, again, especially because you have to realize, like, the religions that you were talking about, we're not talking about the religions like today. We're talking about religions where people are eating each other. Where people, religions where you're sacrificing, like in the Canaanite, human sacrifice, which the Romans had no love for human sacrifice. 
Um, they, at times through their history, engaged in it when pushed to the extremes. But for the most part, Rome was very anti-human sacrifice because if you know what Rome's main enemy for a long period of time was, Rome's main enemy was North Africa, Carthage. It's where Hannibal will come from. Hannibal will come across the Alps, try to invade Rome. And now in Carthage, Carthage was a Phoenician colony. And so in Carthage, they worshipped Saturn. Okay, so you can see the connection between Saturn and Baal and the Baal religions. It's also was well known in Carthage that they sacrificed human beings. And so this idea of religions, especially with the human sacrifice, especially when the Romans went into, it was one of the reasons why when Julius Caesar got into Gaul and into England, Julius Caesar went through and killed all the Druids. Killed all the Druids, killed every type of thing like this because he recognized that they wanted nothing to do with human sacrifice because there was the Druids practice periodic, wasn't a normal part, but they did per periodically do human sacrifice. And so this notion of human sacrifice and religion, cannibalism, weird things like that were things that the Romans had no tolerance for. They saw as being horrific, being barbaric, being things that, again, that pagans did. They considered their own religion, which they had adopted from the Greeks, to be superior. So they didn't engage in these types of things for the most part. It's also why even the Romans at times will go after the Bacchian cults. The Bacchian, if you know who Bacchus is, he was the fat drunk god. Okay? And they'll go at times after the Bacchian cults because of their excesses, because the Romans did not like excess. It was like, go as far as you can, but don't go over the line. Right? That was Rome's policy. And especially towards culture, Rome will be much more politically speaking, tolerant, as long as you have an ancient religion. So when Rome goes over and helps the Jews during the time of the, again, all the different things we see from movies today, Pompey will go into Jerusalem in 63 because for a short period of time you'll have the resurrection of the Jewish state where they will have no influence from the Greeks or from the Romans, but eventually Pompey in 63 will bring an end to Jewish independence and will establish a Roman colony under Jewish leadership. So that was kind of Rome's kind of way of trying to appease the locals. Didn't want to force the Roman society on them, as long as they paid their taxes. But if you wanted to be a Roman, you could become a Roman. You just had to pay a lot of money, right? But if you had a Roman, you also had certain status. You had certain privileges. The reason why I bring this up is that this will be something which will, Paul will make great use of, is that his status as a Roman citizen, because his father bought probably Roman citizenship. So if you paid money, you could do it, just not unlike the United States. <laughs> so Pompey will go in, will bring it to an end. Julius Caesar, again, um, in 45, so within 20 years, Julius Caesar will defeat Pompey. We all know Julius Caesar and how that he will bring an end to the Republic. And then you'll find that in 40, so Julius Caesar in 45 BC will defeat Pompey. Herod the Great because of his helping of the Romans, because he's politically in bed with the Romans, Herod, who's kind of this half-Jew, or who at the time, Herod is not well liked because he's recognized as being kind of this, well, is he really Jew or is he not? His family was kind of forced into it. Herod will make alliances with the Maccabeans. So the surviving Maccabeans, who are recognized as being the leaders of Israel during their time of, of independence, to try to appease the traditional Jewish people he will marry into, and he will likewise try to get in bed with both parties, trying to bring them together. And Herod is actually a fairly brilliant figure. Like, politically speaking, we think of Herod in a bad light because of the massacre of the innocents from the Gospel of Luke. But for the most part, uh, Herod is actually very interesting, and he's a very savvy figure. Like, he's not just like this brutal guy. He was confronted in a very brutal part of the world, and so he adopted brutal tactics. But for the most part, he was actually a man who was, for the most part, a moderate. He was a builder. And that's what he recognized. Like Solomon, he wanted to build things. And so he will rebuild the temple. He will take the temple and he will rebuild it. And he will rebuild it into a marvelous structure. It will be called the Temple of Herod. It will be called the, the Great Temple, but it will be identified as Herod's Temple, which will be this monstrosity. He will also heavily tax the people to do this just like Solomon had to tax the people. And so, but from the traditional Jewish elements, the traditional Jews of the city, especially the ones who are for Jewish independence, will not like Herod because he's in bed with the Romans and they want no Roman interference. Does this make sense? Herod also, if you remember, I think I preached last, last Christmas about Herod's family. Herod has, 
you think you have family problems. <laughs> Just read about Herod. Herod who, again, his first wife, if you, ever ha if you think you have a bad mother-in-law, you should know about Herod's mother-in-law, who he married this princess, but his mother-in-law hated him and tried to kill him multiple times, destroy the relationship with, this, princess, with this, this Jewish girl he absolutely loved and adored. And he actually really did love and adore this girl, but likewise he was eventually forced to put her to death because of, again, accusations that she had cheated on him as well as all these different things. He then marries and has all these different wives, he has, which has all this slew of children, the children will all start com combating against him, especially the two sons of the first wife will get angry, obviously, because he killed their mother. Mm -hmm. So they will revolt against Herod and try to kill him. Herod will find out, will kill both of them. The next son will come out. He'll go over to Rome. He'll get in bad with the Romans, so he has to ostracize him. So Herod has a very interesting life and a lot of family problems. Mm -hmm. All right. He's also, Herod will become extremely paranoid, or you could say he becomes very aware of how many people want to kill him. <laughs> you're not, see, to a certain extent, he's accused of being paranoid, but you're not paranoid if it's true. <laughs> and in Herod's case, it's actually true. <laughs> because he is at this weird crossbed. He's this person who's not recognized as really being a Jew. He would have seen himself most likely as a Jew, but really, I mean, he was more about the political office as well as building an empire and things like this. But he will, at one point, he will depose the Maccabean high priest, okay? So that he will use politics and things like this to depose the high priest, the high priest who will claim to be a descendant of Zadok, going back to David. Remember, David has two high priests. When Solomon takes over the kingdom, Solomon will only have one high priest. He will get rid of the second high priest. He will get rid of the second general because you'll find that the kingdom almost splits after David, so this big almost civil war. He'll exile one high priest, Abiathar, to a little town, which is actually where the prophet Jeremiah comes from. But the Maccabeans would have claimed Zadok, and so they will claim this. And so there's this political strife as well as, excuse me, religious strife that happens during Herod's reign that's going on. And so what will happen as a result is that when he will, through political things, kind of depose or have at least influence the de de um, deposing of the high priest, and the replacing of one who's more sympathetic towards him, you will have a huge rue, a huge fight that breaks out among conservative Jews. Does this make sense? That breakout will cause a rift in a party called the Sadducees. So you will have conservative Sadducees who basically say, we wash our hands of this. This is all corrupt. Ever since the Romans came here, ever since Herod, this is all corrupt. We're tired of all the corruption. We're tired of all this. You know what? You all can burn. We're going off into the desert, and we're going to wait for the promised land. We're going to wait for the Messiah to come. And so this group of Sadducees, this group of priests, go off to the desert and will create what's called the Qumran and Dead Sea, Sc Dead sea Scrolls. This is where you'll find the rise of what's a party called the Aseans. From the Aseans, you'll find the rise of a prophet whose name is John the Baptist. Okay? It's also why John the Baptist's father is in the temple offering sacrifice. Remember, he's Zachariah is in the temple when he's offering sacrifice. It's because his father's a priest. The priests were the Sadducees. Does that make sense? So with that, you'll find that John the Baptist will come from the Aseans community, this conservative Sadducees who basically got tired of all the politics. But guess who's left in Jerusalem? The corrupt Sadducees, or at least the ones who are more politically as well as financially motivated. The ones who are in bed with the Romans, in bed with that. It's also what kind of Caiaphas, who Caiaphas and his father Ananias are. They're corrupt priests. Does this make sense? So Herod, who will become king of the Jews in 40 BC and will basically rule as the king of the Jews in Israel, but under Roman, again, leadership, that you'll have then the rise of two main parties. You'll have two main parties at this time. You'll have the Sadducees, but then people who are not, who don't follow Zadok. You'll find another group of people who say that no, Zadok was not the only priest. Right? There was two priests under David's kingdom. And the second party will follow the line of what's called Abiathar, right, from the prophets. And this other group will actually so much stress the prophets, and you know that this because if you go to and read back to Sam, go back to 
uh, first kings where Solomon will banish Abiathar to this town and then you open up the book of Jeremiah it says that from the same town Jeremiah comes so that's who Jeremiah is so in this line you'll find that the Sadducees who are the political priests as well as the priests of Israel will not be recognized universally as the only authority there's other people who are claiming authority and this will be the Pharisees the rabbis now the Pharisees and the rabbis for the most part they will worship in the temple but for the most part a lot of the Pharisees and the rabbis will also be in the synagogues they're going to be leading the the weekly Sabbath services all right so it's not quite the same as like that we come sometimes things it's a little bit different but they're leading the Sunday services they'll do their duties to the temple when they have to but the Pharisees for the most part don't like the temple they're not very big fans of the temple because they also see the Pharisees are very conservatively minded, but they're not priests. But actually, they're not going to necessarily get along with the Essenes. Pharisees and Essenes split because the Sadducees and the Pharisees are very different parties. The, Sad the Pharisees are going to be devolved along religious lines, but the ruling body of Israel, the ruling body who made most of the laws and things like this, did the day-to-day -day practices is a body of, called the Sanhedrin. It's like a congress. And the Congress, the Sanhedrin, had to get along. So you had in the Sanhedrin, you had Pharisees, you had scribes, and you had Sadducees. This makes sense? What, what time is it? Let's take a five minute break, and we'll be back right at this in five minutes. All right, we are going to begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We just ask you, Lord, that as we come back, to just help us to have clear minds, and to open up our hearts and minds to see where you're leading us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. So, jumping back into the political situation at the time of Jesus. Two main parties is the Pharisees, the Sadducees. I had a question to explain the difference between the temple and the synagogue. The synagogue is going to be the main area during the time of the Babylonian exile, especially, you're going to have the rise where they can't do temple sacrifice. But they're still going to hold and keep the Sabbath, the Jews. So they're going to meet together in houses. So they're going to meet together in different locations where they're going to still worship God. They will read Torah, but they won't be able to participate during the time of the Babylonian exile because there's no temple in temple sacrifice. And so you're going to have this tradition that rises during the time of the Babylonian, which will extend outwards, especially into New Israel, of this idea of synagogues. Okay? this gathering place for Jews where they can go and worship God in the absence of temple. Okay, and people will like that. They'll also read the Torah and they'll do a lot of the things. That, wasn't, that doesn't really happen in the temple. The temple was about sacrifice. It was about the removal of sins. It was about the way in which you had to come and make reparation for sins, Yom Kippur, things of this nature. You came and did all the different atonement sacrifices and things like this. So in the temple, the temple is very important because it gets rid of sins and connects the people to God or at least covers over sins and things like this. It's also why the Pharisees will be very upset with Jesus when he starts to compete with them, <laughs> right? No one likes competition. And in the competition, Jesus is giving free forgiveness of sins. Not only does this have blasphemy connotations because he's doing what only God and God alone can do, but it also has money connotations. There's a lot of money involved in the sacrifice of animals. You gotta buy the animals. You have the money changers outside the temple. Why? Because you had to change your monies to buy the animals which were required for sacrifice. Turtle doves if you were poor, lambs or goats or oxen and things like this. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of money involved. And that's where actually, for the most part, that's why the temple was always, more often than not, often accused of financial, um, of financial problems or likewise greed and things like this. Because there's a lot of monies involved. So that's the difference kind of between temple. What happened in temple was, was slightly different than what happened in synagogue. Does that make sense? So synagogue, so again, the Pharisees for the most part are going to be the leaders in the synagogues and things like this. They will worship in the temple and they'll go and make their, do their duties and pay the temple tax and so forth and so on. But you're going to have the Sadducees are much going to be much more invested in the temple. As a result of this, you're also going to find that who they are going to claim to authority, the Pharisees are going to stress the authority of this defunct priest, Abiathar, who they will see as kind of being behind the whole prophetic tradition. So they will go and they will promote the prophets. 
they will talk about the prophets quite a bit, okay? Especially all the prophets who are critical of the temple, <laughs> right? Especially like Micah and things like this. So they are very familiar with the prophetic tradition, and they will consider all of the Tanakh, all of the Old Testament. The Tanakh is the Jewish word for Old Testament. They'll consider all of the Tanakh to be the word of God, okay? And the Tanakh, which they had at that time, is going to be a Greek translation. Now, they also have the Hebrew and things like this, but there's going to be a common pocket, a common version that people could carry around, things like this, which was called the Septuagint. It was written in Greek. This will have implications later on. But the Tanakh, which is what the Pharisees used, it's also what Paul, being a Pharisee, is going to be very familiar with the Septuagint, very familiar with the tr traditions, with the prophetic traditions, talk about the prophets a lot, right? Because he is a Pharisee. The Pharisees love the prophets, especially the anti-temple prophets, because this criticizes their political opponents, the Sadducees. The Sadducees will not accept the Old Testament. The Sadducees only will accept the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, Torah. They'll only accept the law, and they'll say that the law only applies to us. <laughs> Uh, the law applies, especially the priestly law. They might say the Ten Commandments apply to everyone, but the priestly laws, the book of Leviticus, only applies to the Levites, the authentic priests. We are the priests. These apply to us. Don't worry about this. We'll take care of the laws. You pay your monies and give us what we want, and we'll take care of you, right? And, but the Pharisees will say, no, the whole law applies to all of us, right? So this is a big question is, what does the law apply to? Because the Pharisees will say it applies to everyone. The Sadducees will say it only applies to us. Just pay your taxes, this makes sense? So in terms of what they will consider, they also will not accept anything except for the law of Moses. Now you can say that this is because they only accept Moses, they don't accept the prophets, but they also go back to Zadok, who is the authentic priest, and during the time of like Aaron, there's only one priest, Zadok is the priest. They, so they won't like this other, this alternative Abiathar line. And Jesus at one point actually will reference this. It's very subtle unless you know this history. But when Jesus, actually, Jesus makes a fupa, right? He'll say, during the reign, he'll be talking to them, and he'll say, during the reign of Solomon, when Abiathar was high priest of Israel, that's wrong. He wasn't. Zadok was high priest of Israel. Abiathar got exiled. But what is Jesus pointing out? He's pointing out exactly this conflict. You're both claiming two different priestly lines. That's why in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews won't talk about Abiathar, and it won't talk about Zadok. Does anyone know who it talks about? Melchizedek, the priest that even Abraham bowed down to, and that Jesus is in the line of Melchizedek, right? Avoiding, just avoiding this whole issue of who is the real high priest, Abiathar or Zadok. Does this make sense? So in terms of their authority, who their priestly authority, who their scriptural authority, again, what do they consider to be the word of God? It's going to be a hotbed issue. Also, because they only accept the first five books of the Bible, the first five books of Torah, the Sadducees, for the most part, are going to be nearly atheists in terms of like spiritual things. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in eternal life. They don't believe in a spiritual realm. They don't believe in all these different superstitions. Okay? The Pharisees will. Pharisees believe in angels. The Pharisees believe in demons. The Pharisees believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees believe in eternal life. They believe in all these different things. They think that we're outside of eternal life, but we can't access it. But they believe in all these different things. Because you're also going to find all those different things found ex especially through the rest of the tra prophetic tradition and the wisdom literature and things like this. You will also find them in Torah. You'll find like Abraham who has encounters with, with the angels come to his door and things like that. But you're going to find that the Pharisees' understanding of the scriptures is going to be actually very much like the Catholic Church's understanding of scriptures today. They will talk about the wise interpretation of scriptures. They will have a methodology for interpreting it. Five different ones. It's called Debez. Again, Sad, Deresh, all these different ways in which you interpret the scriptures. The metaphoric, the analogical, the anagogical, things like this. Does this, does this make sense? Not, I don't want to get into a scripture class because I teach a scripture class as well. But just getting into that, so the Pharisees are going to be also scripture scholars, and they're not going to be fundamentalists, not at all. No Pharisee is a fundamentalist. Actually, Pharisees couldn't stand fundamentalists, because you know who the fundamentalists are? The Sadducees. 
So it's not a direct parallel to ourselves today because it's going to be the Sadducees who will be the fundamentalists. They will only believe in the strict, literal interpretation of the law. They will not believe in the wise interpretation of the law, founded upon the Tanakh, founded upon Midrash, the Midrash, the traditions, and things like this. Why? Because those things are outside their control. It's much easier to control five books than it is to control this whole history, right? So you're going to have main huge differences on this. And this is also, these differences is what St. Paul is going to make use of. St. Paul, when he's dragged in front of a Sanhedrin, he's going to be what? And they're, they're determining whether or not he's going to get killed right there. Paul has every intention of getting out <laughs> and of going to Rome. He doesn't want to die there. He wants to go to Rome and evangelize in Rome. So what does he say? He says, I'm a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees, and the reason why these people right here are trying to kill me is because I believe in the resurrection and I believe in spirits. <laughs> That's all he says. Doesn't say, I, I believe in God, the Father. <laughs> he what? He uses their culture against them. And what? Then you have this huge fight that breaks out in the Sanhedrin as the Pharisees stand up and say, no, this man is innocent. And the Sadducees say, no, he's guilty. <laughs> and they're just drowned out. And they, what? they get into a big, huge armed conflict. And Cornelius has to send down the soldiers to separate this big, huge fight that breaks out because he's saying, basically, the reason why he's trying to kill me is because these Sadducees are trying to kill me because I'm a Pharisee. Hmm. Does that make sense? So Paul will discreetly leave out certain things, like, I believe in Jesus. <laughs> he has no intention of getting, of getting out, and that's where he'll get saved and be sent ultimately to Rome. <clears throat> so again, the limited self-ruling Jewish body, and this will be the most part which is taking care of much of the day-to-day -day affairs of the Jews. One of the things which the Sanhedrin could not do, they could not kill people. Rome reserved that right to themselves. The Sanhedrin did not have the authority to kill anyone. Now, there are things in Torah, there are things in the Old Testament, which gave the death penalty. Blasphemy being one of them is a crime that deserves the death penalty. And so they, but the Sanhedrin did not have the ability, and the Rome would not kill people based upon Jewish law. Rome would only kill people based upon Roman law. You violated Roman law, which brought about capital punishment, Rome would kill you. But if you violated a Jewish capital law, it became defunct. Does that make sense? So it's also why when Jesus is dragged in front of Pilate, Pilate recognizes almost immediately what this is. This is yet another Jewish internal squabble over their stupid book of the law from Pilate's perspective, right? That's why he wants nothing to do with it. He's like, I washed my hands of it. This man's innocent. He's not, he's not, he did, Pilate doesn't say he's innocent of blasphemy. He says he's not guilty of breaking any Jewish, of breaking any Roman law which is why then the, Pharisees, then the Sadducees will come out and they'll say, rebellion. Rebellion, he's trying to recite, he's trying to incite rebellion. He's a revolutionary, right? Because revolution was a capital crime. And that's why, yeah. He was crucified under the rule of Pontius Pilate. But by the Roman standards, what Jesus was crucified for was being revolutionary. From the Jewish Sanhedrin court, he was not killed. He was not condemned as a revolutionary. He's condemned as a blasphemer. Because you have two different codes of law. You have two different codes of law. One code of law, which people, the, the conservative Jews, want to be the code of law of the land. But which, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be, never, 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 sorry. <laughs> I almost said something, but I'm not going to. So <laughs> um, let me put it this way. Many Muslims want to live by Sharia law, right? But they're not allowed to. Does that make sense? Many Muslims want to live by Sharia law, but they live in lands where Sharia law is not permitted. Okay? So if you, that's the law of the, Mu that's the Muslim law which allows for certain things with certain conditions. But so what? So if, they, if you can't die under Sharia law, and likewise the lands prohibit it, then you have to find, what, a legal way to do it. And that's basically the, this, uh, similarly what happens at the time of Jesus. They don't, they, he, has broken, he has broken by their standards Jewish law, which brings about capital punishment, but they know that they can't do it because Rome has the ultimate say, and Rome has made their Jewish laws defunct in cases of capital crime. So that's why they have to use a s they have to use a back door sneaky tactic 
to get, condemn Jesus for revolution. That's why Pilate doesn't buy it. Like, Pilate doesn't buy it. He's like, he's not a revolutionary. He's like, he goes in and questions him. He's like, who's your father? And he's like, he's like, they're saying you're the king of the Jews. Are you saying you're a king? And then Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And he's like, he comes out, he's like, he's not, he's not a revolutionary. And then he brings out a real revolutionary, Barabbas. And he says, here's the revolutionary. Which one do you want me to free? And then they make him free Barabbas, the real revolutionary. So, but anyways, so the Sanhedrin's divided upon political lines. Again, the Pharisees are going to be sympathetic to the zealots, the people who want to bring it back and get rid of Rome. Kind of this very conservative, very militant Jewish. They're going to be sympathetic, but the Pharisees, for the most part, are not going to be zealots themselves. But they will be sympathetic towards the zealot cause versus the Sadducees would have no love for the zealots whatsoever because the zealots threaten to destabilize everything because you have periodic revolutions which are going on in the Jewish state, but nothing really big because as soon as a revolution starts up, Rome will come in and crush it and kill everyone and they'll crucify it and leave their bodies by the side of the road as a warning to people not to rebel against Rome. Also, Sadducees will be pro-Rome versus the Pharisees are going to be for the most part pro-Jewish state. You're going to find that the Pharisees, their main temple, their main place where they're going to gather as well as their main center or sphere of influence will be the synagogues versus the main sphere of influence of the Sadducees will be the temple. Also, what's going on is going to be very different, like what I said before. Pharisees will believe in the resurrection of the body, spiritual realms, and things like this, and that the Sadducees will believe that when you die, you die, and that's the end. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, because when you die, you're dead. That's it. Yes? They believe in God, but they don't believe in they don't believe in an afterlife for human beings. They believe in God and they yes. So they believe to a certain extent it's like do good things, God will reward you in this life. No, we're gonna get into the Sians in just a second. So the Sians are gonna deviate away from because remember, these are the Sadducees, for the most part politically corrupt. Okay? Yeah. As well as spiritually, you could even say to a certain certain part spiritually corrupt. The Sadducees will die out as a political party as soon as the, uh, Rome falls. The Essenes are going to be the spiritual ones, the spiritual priests, as well as the conservative priests who will fl- go off into the desert and leave the Sadducees for their own thing. That's why there's a kind of even a separation of words between Sadducees and Essenes. But they arise, they come from the same thing. The Essenes, the main reason when the Essenes, the main split of the Essenes is going to be when Herod overthrows the high priest and replaces him with this guy named Jonathan. Does that make sense? But we'll get into that in a second. So Sadducees, the Pharisees are also very excited and looking for a Messiah, and they want a Messiah. The Sadducees are content with the status quo. They're not content. They're not looking for, nor do they want any type of Messiah. Um, also, the scriptures, their what they understand to be the Word of God, is going to be very different. Only the Torah, only the first five books, versus the entirety of the Old Testament, and the Old Testament that the Pharisees at this time would have accepted was the one which was the Septuagint which was composed in Greek in about the year 280, I believe. Then the other one, you'll have the Zealots, who are trying to bring about the military restoration of Israel. Again, Israel now, the state of Israel through any means, even through revolution, this is going to be the Maccabeans and the successors, the descendants of the Maccabeans and everyone who's of a Maccabean mentality. And if you know anything about the Maccabeans, again, the Maccabeans were brutal, and they had no problem. Judas Maccabees had no problem killing people who he considered to be violators of the law and things like this. Holy warriors. Pharisees will be sympathetic. The Sadducees will hate them. Rome will not tolerate them whatsoever. As soon as you find zealots, Rome will send their soldiers in to kill them, which is why a lot of this will happen through subterfuge. Um, Then you're going to have these crazy people off in the desert, which are these defunct priests or these um, discalced priests, these priests who have left and who had this big, huge rue with 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 the traditional priests, with the Sadducees. And these will be the Essenes. The Essenes will believe in spiritual renewal. They will believe to a certain extent, like in the spiritual reality, when you die, you become a spiritual being. They'll believe in the spiritual, not the literal interpretation. They're not quite the same as the Pharisees who kind of believe in the wise interpretation of scriptures. The Essenes will believe in the spiritual interpretation of, of scripture. Much more of a spiritual mind and spiritual mindset, spiritual repentance and things of this make. They're much more spiritualists. That makes sense, especially through repentance and spiritual signs, spiritual symbols. It's why the Essenes will be baptizing people, because it's a sign of spiritual renewal. That this external sign demonstrates an internal 
change. Does that make sense? Yeah. Baptism was a very common symbolic gesture which entailed the contrition for sins. The difference between Jesus' baptism in the New Testament and the baptism that was from the Essene tradition, the Essenes would have never placed forgiveness of sins upon baptism. Never. Baptism did not entail forgiveness of sins. What it intended, was it, what it showed, was a contrite heart. And God was pleased with a contrite heart. So to a certain extent, like in our sacrament of confession, we have contrition. Number two? Anyone know? Not absolution. Huh? Yeah, confession. So you, first is contrition, then confession. You say it. Then you receive absolution. Then you have penance. Okay, the four steps of penance. So this time, what the Essenes' baptism would have entailed was contrition, confess, possibly confession, but it would not have ever entailed any absolution. Absolution is only possible through the sacrifice of the lamb. Right? That's the only way you could get rid of the sins of the people, and that was a collective thing. It was not an individual thing. But, the, but this entailed an individual. It was an individual act as opposed to the Yom Kippur and the sacrifice of the lamb in the temple, which entailed a collective forgiveness of sins. This is a more of a personal, personal act and personal, which is where you'll find, actually, if you look at the two, you'll see the combination in the early church of the two, the collective forgiveness of sins as well as the individual forgiveness of sins, an individual act and things like that. But at this time, you're not going to find that these baptisms, these symbolic spiritual acts, are going to remove sins. John the Baptist would not have said that. Actually, anyone who said that would have been killed for bla or would have been condemned of blasphemy. Because the only person who can forgive sins is God. God is the only one who can forgive sins, which is why the Pharisees and the Sadducees have no problem with any of Jesus' miracles. They get really upset when he starts talking about the forgiveness of sins. Because the only one who can forgive sins is God. Does this make sense? That's why when, they, when he starts talking about forgiveness of sins, they start screaming bells above <laughs> and things like this. So again, spiritual renewal and repentance. Again, the Pharisees will find this appealing. Um, the Sadducees are going to find this irrelevant. And Rome is not going to care what, what these crazy people are doing in the desert as long as they don't cause any problems. They're just kind of spiritual kind of hippies off in the desert doing whatever they want. So then you have Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus who comes about, and obviously the son of a carpenter, son of Joseph. The historical facts, no, no serious scholar today doubts the historicity of Christ as a historical figure. Obviously who he was, what he said, things like this. This will all, in terms of history, be under great, again, criticism and things like that. A lot of controversy over that. From a Catholic perspective, not so much, but from a historical perspective, obviously what Jesus did, what he said, who he was. That's why you're finding even like Thomas Jefferson some of you might be familiar with the Thomas Jefferson Bible where he cut out only the words of Christ. They didn't want to see any other influence except the words of Christ. And that's called the Jeffersonian Bible. Um, so, no serious scholar, although well, some people do it, even from secular sources, from Jewish sources who are not Christian. Josephus attests to Jesus. You'll find that the Roman historian Tactus in the first century also attests to the historicity of Jesus. Two secular sources or non Christian sources which attest. No one really. No, no serious person, no serious scholar or his serious historian doubts the historicity of Jesus as a person, um, which is an important thing because sometimes you'll hear people are like, oh, we don't even know if Jesus existed. No, we do. <laughs> I mean, just in terms of even empirically, we know he existed. Again, and obviously we have the direct apostles and the disciples of Jesus who attest to his historicity um, in terms of their works and things like this. Undisputed historical facts. These are the undisputed, no serious scholar disputes any of these five different facts about Jesus' life from a historical, just empirical model. First one is birth, that he was born. Now, the details of his birth will be contested, but that Jesus was born, no one will actually contest. Second one, that he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And the reason for this is that the baptism by John in the Jordan causes the early church a lot of turmoil and stress. So like, this would be something which now, now we understand today, it's, we can explain it, but in the early church, this was a very troubling thing that Jesus himself was baptized because of the symbolic nature of baptism. Why was Jesus baptized? 
because if it's about forgiveness of sins or if it's about just the contrition for sins and things like that, it makes doesn't, if Jesus is God and he claimed to be God, why was he baptized? So it brings up, and this is from like a negative standpoint, it brings up so much problems in the early church for having to explain, and I've read some crazy interpretations for why Jesus was baptized, <laughs> right? Um, but what I would say Jesus is doing is he's combining these traditions as well as giving it something new. And then something new is that in baptism we are claimed as children of God, sons and daughters of God. Because that's what Jesus said. Behold my beloved son whom I am well pleased. Every time that we are baptized, when we were baptized, we became the children of God by the removal of sins. But in this, the baptism of John causes so many problems in the early church that no one really disputes that this was actually a historical event. His ministry in Galilee, not a, a non-disputed event, but how long it happened, disputed, because some would say it was one year. As jo- the Gospel of John attributes it to one year. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke attribute it to three years. Historically, most likely, the more likely of them is that it was a three-year ministry. I would say, and because for the most part, John's gospel is a gospel of signs, and he reorganizes events and things like this. And so in terms of like the actual chronology, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are probably actually more accurate in terms of the chronology. I'd say that John is not really concerned with chronology. He's trying to show something else. But in that, his ministry in Galilee, most likely a three-year ministry, his condemnation to death by the Roman governor Pilate. No one disputes the fact that, that Rome killed Christ. 